All right. So I worked on Kids in London for the second half of the summer. Uh, the first half I presented on two weeks ago. Um, so I began this five weeks ago, and Kids in London is um, a well. Let's just start with Kindred Britain. It's a Kindred Britain is the parent project. It was started a couple of years ago by Professor Nicholas Jenkins in the history department. Um, and really was it, what it is right now is a collection of over 30,000 individuals um, who um, are all related to each other in some way. They all come from Britain or are of British descent, and they all um, are somewhat significant. So it started with a couple of significant individuals in Professor Jenkins' own uh, lineage, which he then connected to a group of other significant individuals, um, historical figures and such. And through that action of researching his own personal history, um, discovered that many of these historical figures are connected in very interesting ways. Um, and Kindred Britain 1.0, is a tool to explore those connections in a way that is dynamic, that you kind of get in a um, book of ancestry. Um, and it's much more detailed, as I will show you. Um, who here knows of uh, the Kevin Bacon number? OK, a couple. So the idea is you can trace basically any actor in any movie or television series to Kevin Bacon in six degrees or fewer. Um, so here are some good examples. Um, people who are in that circle, some closer than others. Um, and this is actually based on uh, another individual, a, I think it was a math professor slash researcher who was also very prolific um, in the concept of being able to connect any um, researcher to him through other researchers with whom he had collaborated. Um, that's where that started, um, became very popular through Kevin Bacon. And I just want to point you to a very important one, which is at the bottom, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, so both are American actors, um, but both come, maybe they don't know it, from a very uh, interconnected uh, group of British um, important people, the upper crust, um, 28 exactly, connections between the two. Um, this is a small sample of a very influential group of people. So there are 30,000 people in the database right now. They represent 0.0025 of all people who have lived in Britain over that time period. But I think it is close to, if not over, 8% of all British entries in the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, so they are very important. Um, and in case you weren't yet convinced that uh, the British upper crust uh, a small portion of a very small country. Um, they all know each other and are related to each other. If you looked closely at this lineage, you would find Winston Churchill, um, which goes to show just how small yet influential this country is. Um, three very important people of all <laughs> on the same timeline. Um, crazy. OK, so what is Kindred London then? Kindred London is very similar, yet also very different. It is an attempt to map London over a period of time, starting in 1666, approximately, um, with the Great Fire, which, as you know, um, changed the city greatly, um, was hugely destructive, but resulted in a huge amount of city planning. And 1945, a similar um, events, the Second World War, there was much bombing, resulted in a lot of reconstruction of the city. But in between those two dates, there was basically uninterrupted progress um, where the city grew organically, um, although you know, in great spurts, uh, as you can see in the maps on the side, um, grew geographically as well as in population. Um, and yes, so I will introduce you to the three maps we have used. Um, wonderful maps. I've gotten to know them very, very dearly. Um, the first one is Morgan. It's the one I'm working on right now. Um, finished in 1682. Um, it is it is very, very grainy, as you can see. That is not because it is poor quality, because this map is many feet by many feet um, in its real physical form, uh, and that does not translate well onto a first a small image and then a big screen. But I'll show you the details later. 
Um, next, we have Roke. Um, uh, if we look at the detail at the bottom, this will show you what the scale is like. Um, so this one was finished in 1746, um, just about, what, 80-ish years later? Um, no, fewer, 60. Ah. Um, yeah, 1746. It is, you know, an almost identical um, section of the city, if a little expanded to account for the geographical expansion. Um, and then the last one we have is Greenwood, which I worked on for most of the summer, um, which I like a lot better because it's more colorful. Um, and this one was finished in 1826, 80 years after that. Um, so these three together represent a um, pretty cursory, yet um, very telling cross-section of what London looked like in that period of uninterrupted growth. If we want to look up close, this is what these maps look like in details. They have roads, a lot of them have place names, they're illustrated with trees and stuff, it's really nice. Um, this one is Roke, this one is Greenwood. Um, Greenwood was nice, he highlighted the important roads for us, um, but as we'll see later, he did some other things not very nice. Um, <laughs> All right, so the first step is georeferencing. So if we look at these maps, um, they are not um, perfect at all because these were hand-drawn. They were based on surveys that happened over a manner of years. And when you're dealing with an area um, as large as London and you are hand-drawing it, you are going to make mistakes, um, not just in terms of details, but in terms of uh, you know, capturing um, the exact dimensions, in terms of you know, accurately accounting for different variations in the height of the land and the curve of the earth, et cetera. So what we do is we have to make it so that all of these maps can be superimposed on top of each other and be pretty close to accurate. Um, and that involves taking some landmarks that we know haven't moved from 1666 to the present, um, starting with, say, St. Paul's Cathedral. Here it is in 1682. 60 years later, 80 years later, hasn't moved. Um, it's illustrated differently. You can see that the area around it has changed a little bit, um, mostly just in how it's drawn, um, but it's still there. Next, we looked at, say, the Tower of London, also hasn't moved, although the moat has since been filled in, um, and there are fewer boats in it now, in the Thames. Um, here it is in 1746, and here it is later where they've dug out the side and made a dock. Um, yes, so those haven't moved, and those are really easy. The problem with all of those is they're right in the center, where London hasn't changed much, and where London is very, very significant. You know, you go and you see the sites, you see the London Eye, all that. That stuff is uh, very easy to see. The problem is where we most need to do the georeferencing is around the sides to make sure it's even. Um, and that is much harder, because a lot of those Areas are much, they change more often. They are developed much more now than they were, and they are not very significant. So let's start in the upper left-hand corner where you have this road. It doesn't look very significant, but when you are, this, this is one of my favorite parts of doing the georeferencing, is that you realize that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, <laughs> You look at this road, and what we would do is we would superimpose this with Google Maps or OpenStreetMap to see any similarities, and sure enough, you find them. Now this is all subdivisions. You know, you have trains going through here, you have highways, but that road's still there, and it still looks very similar down to the, the curvature over there, um, which makes it, um, it's not perfect. You know, there's no way to tell really how much that road has been moved in the act of turning it from a, you know, a footpath into a highway. Um, but it's still basically the same road. And if you look closer, you'll see that Primrose Hill over there, um, less surprisingly, hasn't moved much in that time. Um, <laughs> but it's you know, still easy to georeference. That's how we do that. So we get the new maps that are fully georeferenced and are ready to annotate. Um, they look like this. Really. Um, so this is what we've done to it. Um, as you can see, it's all bent out of shape. Um, Morgan, I guess, had to exaggerate this side 
and compress that side, which is why now it is fixed-ish, um, which shows you the extent to which we have to fiddle with these things. Um, but in the end, we could do something like this. That's Google Maps in the background um, today. That's Greenwood in the middle, and that is Rope on top of it. Um, and if we want to zoom in on the side, we can see how the maps are now perfectly aligned over one another. Perfectly. They're really good, <laughs> but not perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, so then this is the part that I've done most of the summer, which is creating the road networks. The goal for Kindred London is to create a navigable set of roads throughout this time period so that we can you know, really get to experience London as it grew, see the changes, but also be able to point to a specific period in time and say, what was this like? Um, the problem with creating a, a Google Maps for London is you have to build it piece by piece. And starting with this, it's, it's not easy. It's, you know, there's a lot there. Um, you can only base so much off of the Google Maps of today or even the closest map. I'll show you later how much things have changed. Um, but we start with something like this, and then after a lot of work, we end with something like this, which is a pretty good um, road network. Uh, this one is less detailed than ones I'll show you, but you can see where right now, in this period of time, this is the road, so it's 1746. Um, there were a few bridges, one or two, maybe three, if I counted right. So you have to use water taxis um, and figuring out how to get from one side of the shore to the other um, without having every single dot connect to every single other dot was one of the challenges we faced. Another example is taking Greenwood here. So I worked only on the southern part. We're smart about this. We have one person work on the south, one person work on the north, and then we stitch them together at the end. Um, Greenwood, I didn't end up with a stitch copy by the time I made this. Um, but here's what the south will end up looking like. There we go. Um, the red lines indicate high volume roads, roads that were heavily traveled, very important. Green one was really nice to us. He highlighted most of these, but not all of these. Um, I think it is green that is the mid-level roads, and then blue that are the smaller roads. Um, zooming in close, this is what that final project will look like. Um, that's St. George's Circus in the middle, which we'll get back to in a little bit. Um, and here are all the various roads. Most of them are unnamed. Um, some of them are named confusingly, but for the most part, we've got it. Um, and each of those intersections has been connected so that at the once this is finished, you will be able to go from one point to another, as we'll see. Um, but how do we do that? Um, that was probably the hardest part of this project. Um, as you can see here, this is probably one of the easiest um, sections, just based on you have uh, the clear high volume roads, you have the pretty clear um, mid volume roads, and the, there don't appear to be too many smaller ones, but you can kind of see them up there, the, the ones that are called places, the ones that are alleys. Um, but one of the biggest problems we faced was figuring out what to name each of these roads. You have, I mean, look at this road right here. Um, you have four different names along that stretch. Um, and in many places, it's even more confusing. I didn't want to put myself through trying to find one like that, but we faced them. Um, the problem being that Greenwood in particular liked to put place names that would have been more helpful to someone trying to navigate the city, um, but don't make it very helpful to digitize the city. So for example, you wouldn't say likely if you were going down the street that you were just going to be on Charlotte Street, you would be specific. You'd say the place you need to go is along Charlotte Terrace, which probably refers to just those um, buildings right there, um, which made it a little difficult. But this is what the final project would look like, the final product. Um, it's not perfect. You know, it's hard to know what to do with a lot of those alleyways where there are clearly gaps between buildings. People would have been able to access it, but it's not marked. It's not really indicated as a road. We did what we could um, with places like this. <laughs> this is Bermondsey. Um, I had a lot of trouble with this one, but there were a couple tools that we could use to go through 
and figure out what we had to do to make it work. The first going back to older maps that we had already done, like Roke. As we can see, the similarities are few, but they're there. The problem is this was mostly fields, open land. Now this is highly developed and, oops, not even in an organized way. Um, what are you going to do? Um, so, you know, if Rope doesn't help, we can actually take the network for Rope, which we had made already, and we can superimpose it on top of it to try to get a feel of where the roads would be. We can see that, at least in Rogue, um, some of those roads that are still there are, um, were, I guess, notated to be more important than they were here. Um, maybe they did decline in importance, but they're still there and probably still travel, so we could um, put those in the final product. You get a sense for the shape of the area, but again, there are all of those roads that kind of go into there and break off or turn into nothing. And, um, it's confusing. You end up with something like this, which is a representation of my best effort, um, but in all likelihood, navigating London in 1826 um, would not have involved just turning in somewhere here. You would have had to back somewhere in there, but we got as close as we could. Um, potential applications. So Kindred London is, well, let's see. I can navigate this. Gorgeous. OK, so here is how it looks once we have finished. And this is Rook. Um, say you want to travel from the front of St. Paul's to right by the Tower of London. Be good to me. Perfect. OK, so you get through routes. The purple one here is based just on uh, distance. So what is the shortest route? Um, the pink one here is much more refined. It goes based on distance, A, but also the uh, class of the road. It prefers higher middle class roads. Um, that would have been for a couple of reasons. Probably speed. It's much easier to navigate through a wider road that's more trafficked. Um, the alleyways would have been um, pretty cramped and full. Um, and also for safety, you know, going through those back alleyways is definitely not as safe. And if you are a person of any status, you would have avoided those um, pretty, pretty fervently, I imagine. Um, so that's why, so those are just two parts of the tools. And it's very helpful to understand um, the different routes people would have taken. Um, if you compare this across different maps, you could see how would the route from here to here have changed? Would it have? Um, and how would the route across the river have changed if we want to go, say, here? Okay, that one's actually pretty good. Um, but, you know, things, you know, once we introduce bridges, you know, how would these routes have changed? How would traffic by any particular area have changed? And how would that have affected the residents? So going back here, um, how do I get it up again? Um, okay, that works. Okay. Does anyone know how I get it to be big again? I go hundred. Okay, I think this will be fine. Um, what? Next to the settings. Here? No. There's a play button between the two um, arrows. Oh. The, well, like, the play button, kind of thing just makes it so Thank you. Crowd source that right Oh, yeah. You'll be writing this down. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's just, uh, you know, one application. Um, uh, Professor Jenkins being in the hist uh, sorry, English department, another um, awesome application is applying it to fictional characters. Uh, two weeks ago, one of the presentations mentioned Miss Dalloway, um, in which the main character, the title character, takes a walk through the city. Um, being able to map her route um, would have been helpful for seeing um, you know, why that route 
you know, things that we know or that people knew back then that we don't know today, you know, what is the significance of this particular road? Would that have been greatly out of the way? Um, uh, things like that, um, or just mapping it spatially and seeing how the exact route reflects on a particular um, neighborhood, um, how that would have played out. Um, artistic perceptions of particular neighborhoods um, is very important, especially if you map it over time. Um, seeing how the way different, um, you know, projects and growths affected different neighborhoods, um, and then whether that accompanies a corresponding change in artistic attitudes of people writing about those areas of London could be fascinating. Um, and last, um, but not least, just determining a route from point A to point B. You know, understanding why people travel the way they do or where they travel. Um, is very important just for uh, understanding in a historical and literary context what is happening. Um, yes. So here's some examples that I noticed just in studying both all three maps. So Regent Street just pops up in this 80 year period. How would that have changed traffic? How would that have changed the um, area around it with those um, what areas did this cut off? Um, and what areas did it begin to feed with new traffic? Who's going there and why? Um, similarly, in that 80 year period, St. George's Fields turns into St. George's um, Circus. Um, as I said earlier, um, you know, why did it pop up like this? And then if we look back at Bermondsey, which went from a bunch of fields to a nest of development, why did they develop differently? Looking at it historically and going through historical you know, files, you know, was this a project or was this just the result of natural um, building? Um, what were the different effects on St. George's Fields and Bermondsey that made them turn out very, so very different um, to the cartographer? Um, and lastly, like I said, the bridges, we didn't have a um, finished road network for Greenwood by the time it made this, but how would those um, bridges have affected the area around it? So you see, when you have the ferries here, you're getting a pretty equal access. People are going to get on right where they are, and they're going to get off right where they need to be, um, which means that those areas along the river were probably fairly equally um, prosperous. With the introduction of bridges, does that concentrate traffic in a way? Um, that, you know, feeds particular communities and deprives others. Um, that's it. Just want to extend a big thank you to Professor Nicholas Jenkins, to Stanley, to Jihei. Um, it's been a great project, and I've loved it. Any questions? Yes. How did you know which roads were most traveled, or which ones were? Oh, well, I wouldn't know that just yet, but you could use, say, a computer program to say, you know, people going from any number of different places here to here, you know, which routes would have been the most, um, which ones would have been the best, as you know. Yes. Were there any, what were the, geographic or map based, what were the challenges that you weren't able to overcome in in doing this? What were the frustrations? Frustrations? I hit a lot of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but definitely trying to achieve perfection with something that's going to be inherently flawed. Mm -hmm. um, like I showed you with the roads, you can't really know exactly how much that road has moved. Um, it could have moved a lot. We found with one of the bridges, um, over the period between two of these maps, um, the bridge had been completely destroyed and rebuilt next to it in a, you know, a similar area but different location, which would have, you know, uh, completely messed up the georeferencing. So, you know, trying to figure out exactly where to do it to make it perfect, um, and just like with Bermondsey, you know, you know, people had to get to those buildings in the middle, but how? How do you map that? Um, that was a struggle. 
Yes. Have you been to London? And if not, when you go, how do you think this will make a difference? Uh, <laughs> it was a long time ago, um, and I went on a touristy trip, so we just saw the big things. Um, I, if I go back, I think it would definitely very much change the way I see the city. It's changed the way I've seen San Francisco. I was up there um, last weekend, and I was like, ooh, I wonder how this road got here. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk to Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Were you able to find out why Regent Street was, was developed during that period? Because it, it had such a huge impact around the neighborhood. Yeah, I haven't really gotten to do much of that um, background research. My job really has been making that road network, drawing it. Um, but that is something I'd be really interested in looking at. Um, just in putting it together, it raises so much quest, you know, so much to think about. Um, and definitely that was one of the biggest things I saw, because it's a big street and it pops up out of nowhere. All right, thank you very much.